Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this month's uh, ACR RFS AI Journal Club. I'm delighted to be here with you tonight and serve as your moderator. My name is Teresa Martin Carreras, and I am a uh, diagnostic radiology resident at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania. I am also an imaging informatics fellow um, and a member of the advisory council for the ACR RFS uh, Journal Club, AI Journal Club. Uh, brief housekeeping notes for today's discussion. We have about 20 to 30 minutes of the presentation uh, and discussion about the article. I put together uh, a brief overview of the, of the paper and we are joined by authors and experts in the field who will I'm sure give us more granularity on the topics uh, that we discuss. And then we also have carved out about 30 minutes towards the end of the discussion for question and answer discussion um, and, 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 and all of that. Um, as a reminder, you can see today's uh, webinar, which will be recorded at the link provided, and you can also see prior webinars uh, from our ACR RFS AI Journal Club at that link as well. Uh, any questions you have will be, ex uh, will be accepted via the chat function of the uh, webinar, uh, so send those our way and we will get to them towards the end of the, uh, of the day or, or time today. Please tweet, highly encouraged. You can tweet us at hashtag RadAIJC. So comments, thoughts, encourage folks to join the webinar, tweet along, um, and we will, uh, we will retweet you uh, and, and, and look at your thoughts for future uh, webinars. So I'd like to also thank many of my uh, advi advisory council members, Lindsay Shea, Jeffrey Rudy, Dan Cohen, Atiz Hiramath and Cyrus Sadipour, who have been very helpful in contributing to these discussions uh, and really make this a, a valuable experience for ourselves and for the resident community uh, at large uh, and the ACR community. So today's article we will be discussing um, was uh, published in 2019. Uh, really, it's, a, it's the our title is A Roadmap for Translational Research on Artificial Intelligence and Medical Imaging. Um, and it stems from a workshop, an international workshop um, in, to, in August 2018, um, which involved the National Institutes of Health, RSNA, ACR, the Academy, uh, the government regulators, um, and much more. Um, and we are joined by two of the authors, Dr. Uh, Viv Allen, uh, Jr., who amongst many of his roles, roles is the ACR uh, Data Science Institute Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Curtis Langlotz, who is Professor of Radiology and Biomedical uh, Informatics at Stanford University and also serves as Director of the Stanford Center for uh, AI and Medical uh, in Medicine and Imaging. So thank you very much for both for joining us. We are looking forward to hearing your thoughts and comments uh, on, this, uh, on this workshop and uh, reviewing your article. So like thank I mentioned, you, yes, thank you. Like I mentioned, the uh, workshop uh, took place in August, 2018, um, and it was uh, a combination of, of, of really uh, the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging uh, and Bioengineering, which uh, convened a two-day workshop um, co-sponsored by RSNA, ACR, the Academy of uh, Radiology and Biomedical Research, which typically goes by the Academy um, by name, and also the National Institutes of Health. Um, there were stakeholders from academia, industry, and uh, even the government, which um, got together to discuss the current knowledge and the research gaps uh, that we have uh, in regards to AI and medical imaging. Uh, they, uh, in this time frame, identified and prioritized future in initiatives for both foundational and translational aspects of AI and medical imaging. The foundational uh, paper was the initial paper, which was uh, discussed in uh, last year's um, June 2019 AI Journal Club, so feel free to refer to that. Uh, today we will be discussing the second portion of, of this, of this two-part um, article from this workshop, which uh, focuses on the translational research aspects of their work, work group discussions. And really to begin, uh, the um, article talked about the cycle of AI from concept to deployment and the importance of understanding every aspect to really get a foundation of how we should proceed from start to finish. So the, um, the whole um, the cycle is based on uh, foundational research, which really fuels every step. And you can see here that there are several quadrants. Um, 
that quadrant one is focused on establishing a clinical need. Uh, quadrants two and three really focus on techniques, machine learning techniques, and their use for creating AI algorithms. And quadrant four really uh, focuses on integrating the algorithm uh, into other uh, applications and basically fulfilling the audience's needs. Um, and that's really sort of the cycle of AI from concept to deployment. Uh, the interconnections that you see here from foundational research to translational research are really the basis of how AI will be delivered to the healthcare community. And so this is lays the groundwork for how we should proceed um, with, um, with all of our discussion. And they begin by talking about the current state. Um, and the, uh, you know, machine learning uh, is basically um, working in small incremental ways to improve patient outcomes. Um, and, and there may be not a single sentinel moment that defines the use of AI in healthcare. Um, the, uh, they make a interesting uh, discussion and analogy to smartphones where folks have smartphones and some don't even realize that their phones have AI built within them. Um, and also, they may not notice that their phones are um, progressively smarter over time and that AI is progressing. Um, they just realize their phones all of a sudden are smarter. Um, so that's sort of the idea. There may not be uh, things that we essentially notice overtly, but over time things are becoming uh, smarter uh, with the use of AI. Um, and really, as we look to incorporate AI into the critical practice and medical imaging, we have to understand the radiology information cycle, and that's really particularly important to us in the medical imaging community. So they delve into the uh, radiology Im information cycle as well. Um, and this is also broken up into quadrants. Um, and you can see here that uh, quadrant one really talks about the uh, decision to request a diagnostic procedure, so really everything before the procedure. Quadrant two of the information cycle is really the preparation of the patient, the protocoling, um, and other pre-acquisition steps uh, before the procedure. And quadrant four really focuses on post-exam interpretation, so interpretation by, our, by radiologists and our recommendations. And so this is really the uh, focus of the information cycle and really having a strong understanding of this and how it functions can help us uh, to, to kind of uh, branch out from that using AI. Uh, and more importantly, we have to uh, understand that currently we are living in a time of narrow AI. And so what, what is meant by narrow AI is essentially a, uh, AI used to solve specific challenges. Uh, certainly uh, the concern that has been raised time and time again is that with, you know, with the uh, growth of computational power um, and the uh, just increasing, rapidly increasing AI use, there may be a time when um, AI can be general AI or an essentially function uh, recognize, learn, uh, and perform tasks like humans, like physicians. But it, that certainly is something that may happen well into the future, but the, the well into the future is emphasized. So, so at the time we are living in narrow AI, and we're really using AI to solve specific challenges, uh, such as pneumothorax detection, lung nodule classification, which we see at many national conferences. There's many competitions that really work to accelerate this process. Um, and that's really the state that we are currently in uh, with, with the use of AI in medical imaging. And uh, they make a note that inappropriately accelerating AI deployment can also actually lead to, uh, may lead to harm and also it will lead to implement potential, mitigating the potential benefits of AI. So we really have to uh, have a pace that is um, acceptable and really sort of uh, pay attention to how quickly we're deploying things um, and are they really benefiting our patients. And, and this was a uh, very interesting, um, uh, here this figure focuses on how good should AI be and how good is good enough? Um, and really, the the concept is that when we think about AI, many folks think, well, perhaps AI should be uh, better than we are, better than radiologists or at all at all levels, right? So for it to be useful, they should be better than the radiologists. But really, for it to be uh, useful, it only needs to be better than the uh, lower end of a radiologist performance scale. So essentially, if you look at, uh, at these graphs, so uh, superhuman AI, uh, which is AI, which is essentially better than all radiologists, is, is denoted as A double prime. And AI, which is better than the lower end of a radiologist performance scale, is denoted with the A prime. So if you see the, um, the, the fact that we don't, when you look at the uh, uh, graph on the right, by simply being better than 
rat A and rat B patients benefit. So you can see a shift to the right with improved a AUC uh, with simply being better than the lower end of the performance scale by radiologists. So we don't, AI doesn't necessarily need to be better than all radiologists, just the lower end of a performance scale to really create benefit for patients. Um, so that idea I think is, is also very important. And then we venture uh, in the article to talk about challenges, gaps, and needs for implementation in the clinical practice. Uh, and frankly, they mentioned, as with all new other technologists, there will be challenges to deployment of AI. Um, and it's important to understand those challenges have mitigation strategies and have roadmaps, such as the one uh, proposed in this, uh, in this paper, to ensure uh, the efficient translation of AI into the clinical practice. Um, and they also make a note that most AI development today is really single institution data. Uh, there's limited research on generalizability of this data, uh, and there are many challenges to collaborations across institutions, which we'll also talk about shortly. Um, and a, a recent review article by uh, Kim and colleagues evaluated the performance of AI algorithms for diagnostic image interpretation. And they found that only 31 out of 560 studies that they included in their review had performed any external validation. So only 6% of the studies. So, so we definitely have a lot of ground to cover in, in collaboration and in making these algorithms more robust and more generalizable beyond the scope of a single institution. And also, when we talk about uh, developing AI for clinical practice, we have to think about use cases and, and, and the needs of radiologists and patients in radiology. So to date, the use cases have been poorly defined in, in the sense that there are lack of standards uh, for inputs and outputs. And really without standards for inputs and outputs, it really beca it becomes difficult to test and train these algorithms. Um, with standard data sets to create those as well. And they may show different results for the, these algorithms may then show different results for the same finding because their, their uh, inputs and outputs are not standardized. So it's really a challenge uh, without standardization. Uh, algorithm, uh, algorithms, uh, they note, can run on modalities, on local servers, on the cloud. Uh, so really having a standard way of accepting inputs becomes very important as they can run at different levels. And AI use cases should be developed by being able to convert narrative descriptions of what the algorithm should do to machine readable language. And that seems like common sense, but really that's how we achieve the best translation of, of actual needs, uh, you know, having a narrative description converted to uh, JavaScript object notation, for example. Uh, so that's really how we reach uh, standardization and, and uh, good use of AI cases. Um, and we all have a role to play, and by we I mean the medical imaging community, in developing these structured cases uh, in general standards so that the algorithms can, um, can be built on similar definitions and deployed in the clinical practice in a similar way. So again, touching on the topic of standardization and our role in really meeting these efforts as uh, radiologists. And so in the topic of standardization, uh, the authors also touch on CDEs, which are probably known to many of you. Um, and uh, basically, there is a high need for structured data uh, for AI, and uh, common data elements is critical to develop uh, and, and translate AI into the clinical uh, practice, the use of common data uh, elements. And for those of you not so familiar, common data elements are basically a unit of information which can be shared um, and, and across information systems, um, and they uh, basically can record uh, an anatomic location, shape, uh, image uh, number uh, and uh, and can store uh, other computer values uh, and they basically allow reports to be built from tiny collections of these from these tiny collections of information uh, there are registries for cdes in radiology such as the acr assist the rad element effort um, and they are used for this purpose uh, for ai use case um, creation and radiology reporting tools so this these the use of CDEs and the encouragement of using CDEs can also help with the process of standardization and, uh, and uh, increasing AI use. And uh, there's also, uh, in terms of standards and, and more touching on standards, uh, there's also a need for high quality data with annotations and rich metadata. I think we've all heard that at some point in, in uh, listening to uh, discussions about AI and, and what is required. Um, but really we wanna develop uh, algorithms that are reliable, reproducible, and explainable, and they make an emphasis on that. Um, and there are many developers out there who are creating uh, many proprietary assets for 
different uh, different purposes, uh, such as labeling, data extraction, uh, workflow integration. But these are all proprietary, and so that limits our ability to collaborate um, in opportunities. So what we really really need or should be aiming for is a democratization of um, AI libraries, uh, cheap access to uh, performance cheap, high performance hardware and uh, emphasizing the FAIR initiative, which really uh, focuses on market, making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So those principles are very important, and that will bring more researchers and developers to participate in AI. And uh, the, they also make a note, and I think many of us have heard of, it, uh, have heard of this as well, that much of the innovation today in AI is concentrated in data reach organizations. Uh, which also limits data availability. And there's also privacy concerns um, regarding sharing PHI, uh, which uh, across institutions, which slows AI deployment and, and development. Uh, but, uh, and something that I, I include here is that, you know, the use of federated learning uh, can really help to expedite some of these issues, I think, and that's um, uh, kind of a, a hot topic at the moment. And but yeah, if federated learning basically allows you to allow several organizations to collaborate um, and develop models without necessarily sharing their sensitive clinical data with each other. And that information stays behind the institution's firewall uh, while they can expose algorithm training to more diverse data from other institutions without sharing that um, sensitive information. So that may be something that can help some of these uh, concerns and issues that are slowing AI development at the moment. Uh, the article also mentions that there are um, uh, a lack of appropriate user interfaces and efficient user experiences to uh, make AI deployment and result delivery uh, more and being able to integrate it better into the clinical workflow. Um, and that individual developers will likely try to distinguish themselves by um, creating these interfaces. But we really need a vendor neutral interoperable standards for creating these interfaces to, to make, it, uh, uh, make it effective. Um, and uh, they also discuss the need for uh, infrastructure needs and uh, working with standards bodies such as the NSF and the NIH to find solutions um, to really reach these goals. In terms of, and, and I was very glad that they included some of these um, topics and touched on health equity and patient safety, um, because we really certainly sometimes as we talk about AI, we, we um, really get focused on the hardware and the software, um, but we want to make sure that we focus and keep the focus on our patients and they are in safe, use, safely using these tools. Uh, and they talk about making sure that we work with developers, the government, and the public to ensure that AI medical practice can be, uh, the, the AI users of AI, the end users such as ourselves, can be confident in the algorithm uh, as accurate, uh, free of unintended bias, uh, safe for patients, and, and protected from cybersecurity lapses. All very important things uh, when using these algorithms. Uh, and they touch on the uh, US, United States FDA, and their uh, efforts to regulate AI medical imaging uh, and uh, computer software that can classify disease processes. Uh, there is an effort uh, by the USA FDA uh, in collaboration with the International Medical Device Regulators Forum to, um, for, to make uh, software, uh, guidance for software as being classified as a medical device, essentially. Uh, and they make recommendations as how to develop that process and how to uh, validate uh, software as a medical device. And this is a um, essentially a, a Nest ecosystem that they discuss, which focuses on the FDA and their uh, processes to provide pre-market review and post-market surveillance for medical devices. Uh, and to make them more efficient and more robust uh, and, and sort of the several efforts that they have um, for that process. And they also touch on the use of registries um, and discuss, the, we've been using registries in, in, in the healthcare since 1989 um, and CMS, CMS has advocated for uh, the use of registries uh, and registry reporting as well, uh, the ACR has over 4,500 sites uh, with, infrastructure to, with infrastructure which allows for sharing of data, transfer using APIs and HL7 and FHIR um, uh, standards. And uh, certainly registries are facilitated by the use of structured reporting in CDEs, which we've talked about. 
um, and collecting metadata in registries is also important to uh, allow to inform stakeholders uh, when algorithms do not perform as expected. So we have that information and we understand why perhaps they didn't perform as expected. Um, so all very important uses of, of uh, registries as well. And uh, the this was a very interesting uh, uh, topic here. They, the, the authors described the diagnostic topic, topic of the future. Uh, and basically it's, uh, this is kind of brought about by the Academy. Uh, and it's essentially the idea of a future state digital platform, which aggregates, organizes, and simplifies medical imaging uh, results and, and patient data. And uh, it places the um, clinicians as the diagnostic pilots uh, in, this, in detecting disease early, uh, making diagnoses accurately, driving interventions, and improving um, clinical management of patients. So this integrated ecosystem is essentially um, it, it takes the inputs, standardized inputs of imaging, pathology, radiomics, um, and other data extracted from the EHR um, and places it in a data storage center, which is available to diagnosticians or the diagnostic pilots. So that's really the, the goal and where we want to be driving our cockpit um, as the pilot. Um, and But it's important that this, um, this data that is uh, extracted here is presented to the human observer or the end user in a clinical useful way to, to be able to generate a diagnostic report in the case of radiology. And here we have uh, sort of a schematic of the integration of AI into the clinical practice. Uh, and you can see here they talk about um, having collecting AI algorithm performance through structured reporting systems um, and metadata about the exams as well. And parameters can also be collected in the background and uh, transferred to registries, which we discuss, um, and AI performance monitoring registries as well to just evaluate how the model is, is performing. Um, the reports uh, ideally can also be provided to all stakeholders and uh, the radiologist, the developer, the, the agencies. Uh, and, uh, and so you can do all of the things that AI will do and also send these variable reports and send the information to the registries and really keep all the stakeholders uh, um, informed or abreast of what is going on with that uh, particular uh, model. In, in regards to some of the limitations that the uh, authors mentioned, uh, really they, they, they make it out that there are there were certainly a diverse uh, and expert field uh, at participating in these discussions um, at the workshop, but they do not represent the entirety of the um, of the of any of these um, sort of uh, agencies. Uh, and there may be other conflicting opinions about these topics, um, in general, other ideas um, that are not discussed uh, herein. Uh, they also talk about the uh, fact that we all know that AI is developing very quickly. And, uh, and so these recommendations, although I do not think that they've become obsolete currently, may quickly become obsolete. So uh, these, so we constantly need workshops like these and, and other avenues to assess and the needs and reassess uh, and, and, and make changes and, and progress in that fashion. And uh, to conclude, really, uh, I thought it was very interesting that they mentioned and they, they were humble about under, uh, mentioning that we, we do have many fundamental questions about uh, the translation of AI into clinical practice are essentially unanswered. So we have a lot of questions um, still, um, but we really need, and uh, this is uh, critically important in this process, is, is open source interoperable standards. Um, and uh, AI algorithms, which can be integrated into the health information resources uh, and methods to develop um, uh, to develop and validate AI algorithms and monitoring um, their performance in the clinical world as well. And we also need to work on uh, prioritizing the AI use cases uh, and determining whether an algorithm should be built uh, at all, right? So it's not, should it, can it be built? It's really, should it be built? So as radiologists and as members of the medical imaging community, we have to figure out um, what is what is what is needed to be prioritized. And some of that may be uh, by doing a cost benefit analysis or other evaluations and to determine not only can it be done, but should it be done? Uh, and implementation strategies should promote payment models that encourage health equity. And we want to make sure that improvements that uh, are afforded by AI applications will be available to all patients regardless of their socioeconomic status 
or the resources of their healthcare uh, facilities. And that's really all I have for now. And we will be happy to take your questions. And I'd, uh, I'd love to hear in, uh, input from the panelists as well. Um, well, well, Teresa, that uh, wow, that's a great presentation. Um, I, I think I can probably uh, speak for Kurt as well as that I had no idea the article was that good. Um, would you have uh, <laughs> done a phenomenal job? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, presenting it, you know, I, I, I don't mind going first here. I, I will just take a, a, you know, a minute or two um, and um, talk a little bit, not as much about um, the article in the past because that's so capably done by Teresa, but really, you know, a look to the future. And um, one of the great things that, that, that came out of this whole project is the, the collaboration between um, our government agency, the NIH, and our sort of special branch at the NIH, the NIBIB, which uh, had been uh, over the years uh, sponsored, promoted uh, uh, by radiologists to to make sure that 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 radiology and what we do had had a special place at the um, in 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 uh, in the NIH and 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 those resources. And uh, you know, uh, Chris and DARPA uh, probably as uh, you know is mostly responsible for putting this together and convening the stakeholders from the the larger radiology organizations to really um, work with them to look at uh, how should uh, federal agencies be spending their money uh, for AI. And so I think we can you know all. Uh, take heart that uh, radiology was well represented uh, um, uh, to the NIH uh, from from this project. And going forward, one of the things I think that, that came out of not only this paper but the other foundational paper was again the emphasis on the need for for data. Um, and and currently, um, you know, the next NIH uh, NIBIB project. That Chris is setting up is is looking at ways uh, uh, for uh, um, the government, as it were, the NIH, you know, to be a repository uh, as a, an honest broker to maybe you know uh, uh, take down some of the barriers that we we've, we've seen uh, as Teresa talked about about uh, um, um, sharing data. Um, I, I think that you know we're still a little bit. Um, uh, you know the article is still fairly relevant. I was going to show you guys uh, um, one, just one slide. Um, um, Stephanie, can you do something that shares my screen, maybe? All right, good. I'm going to say show my screen. So there we go. Is it working? Yep. Okay, yes. good. Yes. Okay. This is this is this is from a document um that the FDA uh uh produced in uh what they call their software pre certification program. So um since the time of that meeting, um the FDA has certainly been working toward toward these things. I won't say that they, you know, adopted what we said, but if you look at uh, some of the things that they think are important um, in AI development, uh, that is good machine learning practices, which of course we believe are the structured use cases with common data elements. Uh, one of the great collaborations between the, uh, ACR and RSNA is the RAD Element Project that is assembling uh, these CDEs that can be used across our specialty. Uh, in a variety of ways, from structured reporting to AI development to registry reporting, in a whole uh, bunch of different ways, so that the same parameters are always defined the same way. So we're going to measure a thyroid nodule in centimeters, and we're going to measure something else in millimeters, and we're going to measure, you know, it's just putting structure around um, how we describe how we describe. And, and roll synonyms into that. Um, then the next one, sort of on the left, was the pre-market assurance of safety and effectiveness. 
uh, I think Teresa pointed out, and, and she mentioned that recent study from the uh, the Korean Journal of Radiology that talked about so few uh, of the published reports uh, have been able to have uh, external um, uh, have uh, multi-site validation, multi-site uh, AI development. Um, uh, the the data sharing issue, I think, I, I think plays into that. Uh, in in tandem with um, um, working with the NIH to see if we can uh, begin to build large centralized sources of data, uh, I think, as Teresa said, we have to to look at uh, uh, will federated learning uh, work. One of the things that uh, that we're doing at the college, the Data Science Institute, is to sort of leverage the connectivity that the college has with um, um, accreditation and registries and, and research and to hook up uh, sites together through a tool that's uh, called the AI Lab uh, that will facilitate um, federated learning. Um, you know, I think the I think uh, there's a lot of research and, and a lot of data to come out from that to say, will that, will these algorithms be generalizable and, and all of the things, but it's going to be, a, to me, a good opportunity to uh, to see if, if federated learning will work and we're working on, on that project. Uh, and then finally, the real world performance monitoring, uh, the registry programs, uh, you know, sort of fit in there. So. I, I, I think that, you know, people are in general sort of on, on the same page with this. Um, the most recent FDA workshop that we attended, though, was talking about what should their approval pathway be for autonomously functioning algorithms. And I think it's, it gives a lot of us a little bit of pause. Um, the one autonomously functioning algorithm the FDA has approved has not been in radiology, it's been for ophthalmology, and it's a, um, a tool that detects diabetic retinopathy. Um, it, 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 it is autonomous, but it's not autonomous in the sense that it doesn't recommend an, op, uh, an operation, it just recommends uh, an ophthalmology ophthalmologic consult so um but they're talking about screening mammography they're talking about sort of rule outs like is there a brain hemorrhage or not okay no brain hemorrhage go home and then we're like so wait a minute what about stroke what about brain tumors what about all the other things that might present like hemorrhage and so i don't know whether you know i don't know where the push is coming from from industry maybe from uh uh from the administration sort of wanting to sort of be, you know, behind this. But I think this uh, gives radiologists an opportunity um, to uh, sort of use what we've learned in these programs to, to uh, these workshops to say, you know, these are the guiding principles that, that we feel are important for, before you can, can uh, let, uh, you know, uh, AI algorithms uh, work, you know, uh, uh, function autonomously. So that's about all I had to add. Uh, Teresa, thanks again for a great job, and um, we'll um, ask you know answer questions. And Kurt, I, you know if you've had a few comments. Thanks, Bib, and thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you, Teresa. And Stephanie, if if you wouldn't mind, if I could share my screen, it'd be great. Uh, And uh, thank you. So I, I find the best way to think about these articles is really uh, with respect. Can everyone see figure one here projecting? Yes. Yep. So I find the best way to go through these is, is just to think about it in terms of the figures. Maybe it's uh, just picture oriented. but. Uh, yeah, so this is, as Teresa mentioned, it's part of a, a two papers, and this figure one actually appeared in both papers, and it was a way of connecting the two and showing how the methods, the foundational research that uh, was proposed in the first paper, the new image recon methods, labeling methods, 
new machine learning methods and explanation, AI explanation methods can have an impact on the translation. So for example, uh, new image labeling methods creates larger labeled training data sets that becomes the AI data that's used in this translational process of creating an AI algorithm. So I think that's, that's just nice to see that linkage. Um, figure two, I think is a tremendous summary of this AI uh, radiology information cycle. I think it's important we're realizing now that most of the early adoption of AI algorithms, the earliest, is happening in this, is likely to happen in this exam acquisition phase. In other words, uh, tools like better image reconstruction, image enhancement, super resolution images, quality control, triage, some of the workflow opportunities are low-hanging fruit for, for AI developers. So that's just something to keep in mind. I really like this figure three um, because it really gets to the issue of uh, the interaction between humans and machines and coming to a diagnosis. And I think it's absolutely uh, a great illustration of the fact that if you have an algorithm that's better than at least some radiologists, it can make those radiologists better and can, can be useful. And we've known since it, not in AI, but since regular AI rule-based systems that we developed back in the 70s and 80s, that if you combine the human and machine, each one was good at different kinds of cases. And so the two together typically perform better than either one alone. And so that's that I think this is really uh, fits well with that notion. Interestingly, there have been a couple of papers recently where AI algorithm that's better than even the best humans and the humans uh, bring down the accuracy of the AI algorithm. So not a lot, people don't really know what to make of that at this point uh, and whether that's really a real phenomenon, but there, there have been some papers that have uh, come to that conclusion. Um, I will, Stephanie, I gather I can text you, I can chat you a link and send out to the group, so maybe I'll I'll just tell you the this is a paper that came out of our center that's, it's a pathology topic, but um, it's, uh, it, it interestingly illustrates that point. And then lastly, I wanted to just jump to table one at the end, because I think this is just a really nice summary of the, uh, of the conclusions of the article, and, and both Teresa and Viv emphasized these as well. Uh, I'll go on order a little bit. Data availability, so important. Uh, there are very few AI-ready labeled data sets that are available today for imaging. There's some kind of clinical data sets. There's an Alzheimer's disease data set, for example. Uh, there's the National Cancer Imaging Archive. But those data generally are hard to get and, and are not AI-ready labeled. Um, if you look at the data sets out there, actually, the center here at Stanford is, is released a fairly large number of these, and I'll, in fact, I'll, I'll uh, just go ahead and uh, make that link available to you also. We've released eight different data sets, so if you or any of your colleagues are interested in trying to build AI algorithms, these are data sets that are freely available for research in various areas. Um, and then there are some data sets at the NIH that have been released by Ron Summers' lab. There's a data set on image reconstruction of knee MRIs from NYU that's been released. But other than those, that's pretty much it. And as Bib says, this uh, federated learning is a, a potentially a really interesting opportunity. But you have to be very careful that the data sets at the different places that you're trying to bring together through this federated learning are labeled in the same way, uh, that they have the same kind of mix of cases and the like. Otherwise, you get some degradation of accuracy. So I think federated learning is incredibly important, important to do research on it. I think it's going to be a, a powerful tool. But I don't think it necessarily does away with the need for some more and larger public data sets of imaging data for AI. Um, next item is just the cases. Uh, I think that's already been talked about quite a bit in this between ACR and RSNA. I think of that element in these uh, common data elements is kind of like um, it's a question and a set of possible answers. It's like a multiple choice test that you as part of reporting that study. So BIRADS is kind of the classic there, like the BIRADS code, one, two, three, four, five, like that. That would be one data element. 
and it's composed of different terms. So each virus has different codes. Each virus code might be one possible answer for that. So uh, the way we think about it, and, and this is I'm wearing my RSNA hat on an ACR call, but RSNA kind of has this technology stack for this terminology issue. So RADLAX is the, the set of atoms or the terms that make up these common data elements. And then there's uh, the RAD element project, project uh, that's kind of the molecules, you know, there's a conglomeration of the different atoms. And then I guess the higher level, you could say, if you wanted to compose a radiology report or a whole set of information about a given you can study multiple data elements together, you could say that's DNA or some kind of uh, constructing multiple molecules. So I'll just, again, I'll, I'll send to uh, Stephanie for, for her to send out to the group the links to the various terms that atoms, the molecules, and the DNA are the terms, the elements, the full-on report templates. Uh, and I think they've done a really nice job talking about the FDA. Just a word about standards. Uh, since this paper was published, there has not, there is now work ongoing on standards. There's an organization called Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, IHE, that's working on a radiology AI results. And so this is essentially, we've got this problem, we've got, let's say, 100 AI vendors. I think there were 130 vendors in the RSA AI showcase um, this past year. Those vendors are trying to deliver results into our radiology workflow, into tax systems. So how is that communication going to happen and be standardized so we don't have, uh, have to have a bunch of different combinations of AI vendors talking to tax vendors they can all do it in a standard way? So those standards are now under development. It's probably take a year or two before the final on standards process. They're slow because they have to develop this consensus, but that's, that's in the work. So I guess those kind of so summarizing my comments, and I just want to end by, again, thanking you for bringing us all together as part of this collaboration on this article and for participating in the, as a co-author of the uh, Foundation's article and for Teresa for making such a nice presentation and summary of the article today. Excellent. Thank you both very much for clarifying some of those topics and, and adding your input. We do have a question from uh, Dan Cohen, a member of the council. Uh, since the article was written in 2018, uh, I was wondering how the situation is today and which updates have been made in general. So more of a general topic as to what you think has changed uh, in the interim uh, that would be uh, added to this sort of topic. Um, well, this this is this is Bib. I, I, I can I'll, I'll I'll go first. I'm I'm, I'm sure that uh, you know, Kurt is probably more um, familiar with uh, um, you know, some of the 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 bottom you know bottom line research, but I, I I guess what I'm I'm seeing is that we are still seeing ourselves. I mean, if you look at our foundational paper and you look at this paper, uh, the need for data uh, uh, is uh, still out there, and. Unfortunately, you know, we have not, as, as Kurt mentioned a minute ago, we really haven't seen um, big swings in being able to produce um, uh, AI from multi-institution diverse data sets uh, in a way that would make us feel comfortable that the, the algorithms uh, will be generalizable um, to um, uh, all of our healthcare enterprises, to all of our hospitals. I mean, well, what works at Stanford? Will that work at, uh, you know, my community hospital in Alabama? You know, are patients, you know, this, you know, the same? Are they different? Well, you know, what are what are all these things? And so, how do you know? And so, I think that you know the need for being able to, um, you know, to do validation and to do uh, performance monitoring uh you know are 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 still critical um i think there's some impatience in the market um and so there's you know a push to um get algorithms to market that uh, you know could potentially be brittle and so having the ability 
uh, to try before you buy to, you know, in some situations before you implement AI at your facility, make sure that it's going to work on, 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 um, you know, your patients, uh, um, learn enough about AI to understand where the pitfalls are, understand how to evaluate it, understand what a confusion matrix is. So you can understand the, the performance of an, of an algorithm on your, your data versus, um, what, uh, was in the FDA because if you look at it, some of these things got FDA approval with only you know 200 cases in the training data. So um, just because it's FDA approved doesn't guarantee that it's um, 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 going to work. Um, I do think that that that, that we're we're moving forward though, and uh, um, uh, the 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 uh, again the emphasis uh, that the NIH is now uh, placing on can they be a, uh, a facilitator of centralized data uh, uh, has a, a lot of opportunity, and so I, I I hope that we'll see that that come. And in the meantime, as as, as Kurt said, we can start testing this concept of uh, federated learning, um, but but uh, with all the due admonitions of of even though the, 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 that we want diverse data, we still have to 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 have those data presented for learning uh, in the same way. So I don't know. I feel like I didn't answer the question very well, Dan, because we we still have a long way to go, in my opinion. Well, and I agree with the, this comment. I think you know, lots of progress. Federated learning is a big one. I think the development of standards is a big one. Uh, FDA. Has made some progress on how they want to regulate. Uh, they have a really hard job because they've got a lot of algorithms coming their way. Uh, and so I think, honestly, I think that they've probably established a fairly low bar, which is appropriate given the number of algorithms and the degree to which they can help individuals and the possibility for post-market surveillance and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think also, Bib touched on this, you know, the marketplace is not the most healthy marketplace today, even though there are a lot of companies out there. Uh, they're not really uh, gaining the traction that probably they thought. And some of that is due to the fact that it's hard for them to get the data they need to produce these algorithms than they originally thought. Part of it has to do with this generalized question that Bib mentioned, that uh, I think they were all imagining that they would build an algorithm and kind of shrink wrap it and sell it like, Microsoft Word or something, they just sell it to everybody and all would be well. But what we're finding is you've got an algorithm that's trained on data from one or two institutions. So the customers are in show me mode as you all should be when you go into practice to make sure that something actually works in your practice before you buy it. So try it before you buy it. And the other thing is that you know, the regulatory, uh, even though it is, I think, at the bar at the right spot, there are only about 40 cleared algorithms today by the FDA. Uh, and I, I texted the, or chatted the link to uh, refer forward on to you that ACR is a very nice website where you can take a look at all of the FDA cleared AI algorithms. So, so those are some of the areas where you know, things are changing, some not necessarily for the better, some are kind of a headwind to the industry, and some I think are are helping us along. Great, thank you. And we have a couple of more questions here uh, from Daniel Valentino. Uh, my question is: Can you comment on the impact uh, of the development of AI algorithms on the new Cures Act final rule issued by ANC uh, related to the Cures Act final rule? Is there a core data for interoperability definition for medical image AI? Oh, that's a great question. I just happened to be researching that question just before I got into this call. So I know, I know the ins and outs of that. So what he's referring to is a new uh, rule just came out that essentially allows, uh, enables patients to uh, have access to their data through what are called APIs, application programming interfaces. They won't use those completely, but apps like your iPhone app developers might uh, use those APIs to access the health data that you have at some institute that's caring for you and make it easily accessible to you through your phone. That was the idea. Um, and that's a great idea, right? Although there are certainly some issues of privacy so that 
Um, I don't know if you all know about Cambridge Analytica, but it was Facebook data. Third parties kind of got a hold of there when people were signing up. They were giving permission for all of this. And there's similar issues that could arise with this health data in that you could have unscrupulous app developers who, um, you know, get access to or somehow um, sell their app to patients or get their app to patients. The patient don't really want to be done with it. And I think that the government position on this, the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT, their position is, well, it's like your banking data. You don't, you know, you don't bank with a guy who's working out of a pickup truck on the corner. You go to a well-known name that people should do that for their health apps as well. Whether that will work out in the marketplace remains to be seen. But anyway, that's kind of like an overview of what that, that rule is all about, is making these APIs available so that you get a whole nice business environment with apps being developed to help patients get better access to their data. The question is about, well, does that work for images? And it turns out the answer is no. So the, the data exchange that is required by that rule is, um, sorry, what is it called? Um, United States Core Data for Interoperability. And it's got the function of demographics, things that you find in a piece. And it has something called the um, radio, uh, imaging narrative, which really I think means the radiology report, but unfortunately not the images themselves. And so when that rule went through public comment, there were many organizations, including RSNA, made a comment that why can't we also include images in there so that those could, patients could actually have access to their images and facilitate their exchange. Um, their response to CMS and the rule makers' response was, that's a little too complicated for the first step here. We appreciate the recommendations, but we'll consider them for possible future uh, enhancements to the rule. So today, uh, image exchange is not required by that rule, but uh, perhaps in future versions it may be. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I would add, and, and um, you know, this has been a, a, an initiative that, uh, uh, the RSNA has been promoting, you know, for years with the uh, image share program and and uh, um, uh, actually getting grants to uh, move that along. Um, got stifled a little bit by industry along the way. Um, you know, we we seem to get have gotten the the uh, potential. Uh, uh, roadblock off the road with uh, Nuance now potentially being on board uh, with looking at all of the all of the vendors that have access to images um, just through their normal work that they do where images are in the cloud or, 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 or wherever to be able to use some of these protocols that have been developed uh, uh, to be able to share images, uh, you know, at a patient's direction with with different hospitals when they change care and that sort of stuff, we've we've sort of, um, you know, everything needs a hashtag now. So if you look around for ditch the ditch, bad, bad say it right, ditch the disc, you'll um, be able to see sort of uh, what uh, the efforts that uh, your organizations are taking to uh, to to uh, facilitate this now? The college and the RSNA both are, are really keenly in in reinvigorating this process. Uh, um, so we fingers crossed. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I just had Stephanie text out a link to that image share. We didn't know it was validation. It started. Exchange to the internet, and then this nice industry sprung up for that kind of thing with various centers. And so now it's worked into a validation. One hospital has one image exchange vendor, and another hospital has a different image exchange vendor, and they both validate their their image exchange service to this uh, their method that's uh, been developed. That then the two companies can exchange images with each other, and that's. I think, you know, really important for us as customers going forward, we want to be able to exchange not just with the customers of the same vendor that we have for our CDs and our image exchange, we want to be able to exchange with everybody. So that's getting toward the kind of national network of exchange, which is really important. 
Excellent. Uh, and we have another question from Pallavi Tiwari. Uh, interpretability of AI has clearly become an important aspect of clinical translation. However, the question is, how do you define inter interpretability, especially for the output of the deep learning models? What level of interpretability would radiologists feel comfortable with while making diagnostic decisions using AI? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, I mean, the, what you typically see are these heat maps, right? That's kind of the state of the art in terms of interpretability. And you know, they're, they're kind of nothing. But they're, they're whole story. Um, and there's a lot of good research. That was one of the research areas that we need to have more attention because they structure the AI models for medicine are different than for other kinds of images. And so they need different state kinds of. Uh, uh, one caveat, which is important to keep in mind, is that really explainability is important because you know, the human and machine work will be better. But explainability is also about, sorry, about trust. So the person using the machine wants to be able to trust its results and by seeking information that helps with that level of trust. And we actually have many things that we do in medicine, just think of uh, Tylenol or, you know, some drugs that we take, we don't really handle the mechanism of it, but we know because it's a clinical trial that it's appropriate uh, to use in certain situations. So it may be that in some cases we we'll never have great explanations for why the model says what it says, but we just know because it's been evaluated extensively that it's going to perform in the setting which is it's being used. Great. Great. Yeah. And oh, go ahead, doctor. No, no. I just I was going to say I didn't really didn't have much to, to add to what to what Kurt said. I mean, I think that. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, the um, um, I mean, you know, I think where we are now is, uh, um, you know, just making sure that um, um, whatever whatever whether the algorithm is going to live on the modality or whether it's going to live in the packs or whether it's going to live in the reporting software or whether it's going to live in the EHR, that that all of the the APIs that make all of that happen and, and link our, our tools together, um, you know, have a standard format. So, um, you know, everybody doesn't, every, every vendor doesn't have to worry about having their own proprietary way of, 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 of getting, getting into the um, healthcare stream. Excellent. Uh, and we have uh, one last question here from Ahmed Moabwad. What do you think a radiologist needs to participate in foundational research in AI? Now, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, there are uh, you need some training. Uh, I, I, it depends on what role you really want in that foundational research. You could do everything from just labeling data to developing a use case to putting together a, a clinical data set that made sense to train the AI model uh, to a clinical trial that might evaluate the AI model once it's built. So all of those take different, or to even like writing the code that would uh, you know do the machine learning itself. Uh, and all of those take different uh, kinds of training. If you're going to want to do the, the coding, there are some good online courses you can take. Uh, RSNA provides some hands-on training and lots of refresher courses in AI. Uh, ACR has the DSI. They have some tools that you can go through and, and get a sense of what it's like to train one of these models. Um, so I, I guess the answer is it, it depends. Um, I'd say most radiologists need... Just like we know about MR physics, we don't know how to build an MR scanner, but we know enough about how it works so that when we see a phase artifact, we know that it's a phase artifact and not a lesion in the liver. Um, and so I think, you know, it would, we all need, and I think that are under development, many different uh, education opportunities. There's something called the NIC, National Imaging Informatics Course for Residents that helps people do basic informatics and AI education. You need just to be an educated consumer. Um, so I 
I mean, I think Kurt has uh, you know summed that up uh, uh, pretty well again. The the um, um, and, you know, obviously it, it, it depends, not, not every resident can be at Stanford at or, or MGH or Ohio State uh, or Emory or other places where they have um, um, large data science um, programs. And so um, I think it's going to be up to uh, us as the radiology community to uh, work with the you know, the American Board of Radiology, the ACGME, others to um, help promote some of the some of the things that, that, that residents will need in their training so they'll be um, you know equipped to to do that, particularly particularly in community practice when um, you know the, there's no dedicated uh, 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 radiology IT uh, person you know beyond perhaps the tax administrator uh, and so you know you end up with uh, somebody like me who um, all I know about how to use a computer you know is to, to plug it in you know so it's like um, uh, the, there is a huge need uh, for people uh, going from training into um, community practice especially with uh, enough of an informatics background that they can be uh, useful to their practices. So, you know, I e even even if you don't have to worry about answering a bunch of questions about it on the core exam, um, I I suggest you know doing just what Kurt said and 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 you know take advantage of of the the tools that uh, your specialty societies are making available to you so you can. Um, can learn to do that. There were, you know, kind of standing room only uh, um, uh, interactive AI sessions at, at RSNA this year. Uh, some of them put on by some of the Ohio State guys uh, that, you know, you know, people were building a model, you know, right, right there on the spot. So, um, you know, they're, they're available. You kind of have to, to, to dig a little bit, you know, we're not uh, to the point of, it being fully integrated into um, our curricula. Hopefully over the next few years it will be, but I think the folks that are in your shoes uh, um, need to take advantage of, of some of these uh, opportunities that Kurt mentioned. Excellent, thank you very much. I, I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. We're a couple of minutes past the hour. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed our discussion and certainly want to thank our panelists for taking their time uh, to bring our expertise uh, to our conversation. Uh, I uh, hope you enjoyed learning uh, about translational research and our gaps and our future opportunities. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will have many more of these workshops and meetings and discussions about how we reassess and, and progress in, in the coming years. Uh, thank you again very much for your time. Thank you to the ACR. Uh, our FES section for supporting the Journal Club and to the Advisory Council. Have a great night, everyone.